Hello, guys. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for joining me here. I'm uh, Priyanka Nayak, and I'm from uh, Palo Alto Networks. I don't know why that failed. Um, and I'll be talking about effective data platforming with open source tools. Uh, most of them are from CNCF uh, open source uh, projects uh, for faster insights. Um, just a little bit about me uh, to uh, uh, recap. Like uh, I've been um, an engineer for about 17 years. First started off as full stack, then moved into back end and went into data engineering just uh, because it was a new unexplored uh, space for the problems that it held. Um, and uh, yeah, and here we are. Uh, so to start off, uh, I want to step back and um, touch upon the journey of data engineering so far. Uh, before uh, data democratization, uh, there were uh, like, you know, the stakeholders uh, generally uh, for data engineering teams used to be senior leaders, marketing teams or sales teams, um, and mostly asking for reports, right? Um, and then uh, the tools mostly used to be batch processing uh, tools uh, and, uh, you know, uh, you, you deal with, like, uh, large amounts of data in data warehouses. Um, I know why this is glitchy. Um, okay. Stabilized now. Okay. So the... Um, and then uh, moving on to the automation, it was fairly minimal. You just needed... Uh, schedule jobs to run and uh, fetch data, bring the data to data warehouses where you would uh, run your, uh, um, you know, uh, typically MR jobs or uh, Spark jobs, batch processing jobs. But after data democratization, we see uh, a change in the landscape uh, where you have uh, stakeholders uh, not only from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, non-technical background, but also from the technical background. Now you have uh, software engineers, AI, ML engineers, data scientists, um, and tools which need, um, uh, tools which need to be, uh, you know, um, which need to provide for uh, faster access to data and uh, enable transactional databases and uh, as well data warehouses because, like, you still have the old stakeholders. And uh, fairly, the automation has to move along with it uh, to be on par with software engineering um, and because of the demands, really, of, like, uh, the kinds of uh, problems we are solving with uh, the data these days. Um, moving on. Uh, so you need um, the need uh, for this efficient and robust data platform architectures uh, becomes evident. And uh, so where like a shift from original uh, approaches uh, need, uh, is sort of uh, needed. And uh, to uh, consider uh, existing third-party services can be fairly expensive to start off with. So, and also based on usage and cost, data engineering teams need to weigh between third party versus open source, and, and also, like, you know, uh, you have to think about delivering value early and continuously. So, sound architecture with clear aims becomes key. And to solve that, uh, let's look at some of the uh, data platform architectural aims. So here, uh, a combined uh, cross-pollinated uh, set of architectural concepts between software and data engineering, uh, sort of, uh, these are things which we are fairly familiar with. Um, like, for instance, modularity, you want to handle data, uh, sep you know, you, you want to have, like, uh, separated data for different purposes, and then separation of concerns, uh, where you want to separate ingestion uh, from processing and from uh, and separated uh, from storage as well. Uh, and having a loose coupling uh, of the system, like, or the entire, like, uh, uh, architecture, uh, within the architecture becomes uh, necessary. Uh, this uh, helps, like, you know, whenever there's a change in some part, it need not, like, uh, break the pipeline of like your data uh, uh, ingestion or uh, processing for that matter. 
um, scalability uh, at every part of the pipeline also becomes uh, you know uh, crucial and uh, low bar for entry and uh, to maintain as well like uh, you want to have like people come in and be able to maintain the data platform as soon as possible uh, it, it, uh, that's just a nice to have uh, feature and obviously low cost um, so far, so good. Uh, it depends, um, you know, uh, all of this is great, uh, but what about stakeholder requirements? This is something we often get asked about as data engineers. People ask us, when are we gonna get to see the data? When are we gonna get to handle the data and use it, right? So if we look at uh, the general laundry list of like what uh, stakeholders, uh, um, you know, want. They want to have the ability to handle and join and uh, enrich data from varied sources. Uh, there's documents, existing data, which are present already in warehouses, and maybe from tools you want to collect, begin collecting data, and you want to have the ability to bring them together and uh, uh, show things, right? So the transmission of varied data sources to points of usage, they want uh, just the data to be available uh, for reporting purposes or probably even third party tools. Um, and obviously like, you know, a quick ingestion processing and availability of lots of data sources uh, is also very uh, uh, crucial for such, uh, um, uh, you know, stakeholders because many times they might be hands off. So you might want to uh, look at like how to give uh, the, uh, uh, deliver the benefits of a data platform sooner rather than later. And uh, similarly, in MI, uh, sorry, ML and AI engineers, uh, you know, they want our data as soon as possible and the most relevant data uh, which is available at that time. Um, so what are the stages of development for such a architecture which considers both uh, data uh, platform like a, uh, trying to satisfy all the architectural aims and also the stakeholder requirements, uh, and how will we build it? So this, uh, there are several stages, obviously, that, like, uh, uh, which I want to like, elaborate on here. Uh, first is obviously understanding your data and pre-processing. Uh, the second step is uh, thinking about like, what tools you want to use based upon the kind of requirements you want to satisfy. and. Uh, also identifying uh, the platform build tools that you want to use because they can fairly uh, you know, make it easy or make it harder for you to maintain the platform. And putting it all together, you have uh, ingestion, uh, streaming and stream processing, storage and dissemination, and obviously like you want to uh, monitor your uh, data platform architecture and also uh, think about the security features that you want to provide. Other features uh, like data catalog may be very useful for uh, people who are hands off. Uh, you know, they're not technical users. Uh, for such people, you'd want to uh, think about like how you want to uh, uh, build the data. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, coming back. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you want to serve even your uh, non-technical users in a better way. And uh, a data catalog is sometimes, uh, uh, you know, gives you visibility as to, like, what data you're collecting and uh, serving them. So the how. Uh, the first step, uh, step which I mentioned was understanding your data and pre-processing. Um, this is about really knowing the data and the data sources um, uh, you know, for your stakeholders before making the system understand it, right? So all of this will involve like having conversations with your stakeholders and understanding like what sort of data they want to bring in, like and how do they want to access it and everything. So 
thinking about like whether they are structured, semi-structured, uh, whether uh, they're stream data, or if it's something which you, where you have to convert like a batch to stream. Um, and how uh, frequently does the data change? And uh, what is the size uh, by which the data grows regularly? And you want to also talk to them at this point about the purge policy. Like how relevant is uh, a, a two-year-old worth, uh, two-year-old uh, worth of data. Like, uh, how relevant is it? Uh, you know, just uh, in uh, in the last week, right? Like, so you want to have like uh, those kind of conversations. And one of the most important things which we neglect at this point is mapping your more uh, ubiquitous synonymous fields in master data. Each team uses uh, different uh, terms and uh, you know. Um, uh, it, different, really, just different terms to identify uh, the same thing. Uh, so you want to ask questions like, is this product ID which you call in, within your team the same as the team ID which this other team calls it uh, as? So you want to be able to relate uh, your fields, and you want to have a way of relating uh, those uh, fields in a way that uh, you, know, you can later on uh, know that, OK, this means the same thing. So whenever you're joining or enriching, you can uh, use um, similar parameters. And obviously, cleaning your data, pruning unused data fields is one example of it. Um, the other thing is also standardizing um, data and event representation. Uh, CNCF's uh, cloud events is a nice example. Uh, there could be other ways in which you would want to standardize it. Uh, um, proprietary, uh, you know, ways of, uh, you know, establishing uh, your um, uh, format of uh, events and uh, data. And uh, the needs of stakeholders, as I mentioned, like, do they want reports or insights, and are they more hands-on or hands-off or both? Um, so you want to have these conversations before. Um, now, based on this, uh, we want to gather our tools. Uh, this uh, schemas in data are very important in the beginning. Sometimes, uh, surprisingly, they are an afterthought. After the data comes through, everybody is like, OK, uh, how, how does the late data look like? What are the fields? What, is the, uh, you know, what are the fields that we are interested in and what we need to focus on? So this is what I would call a stitch in time, uh, really like uh, uh, saves nine later on down the road. So first you want to pick uh, the kind of uh, uh, schema management uh, that you want to do. Uh, you want to have a schema registry, which is really great like uh, to maintain your uh, uh, schemas, uh, the versioning of your schemas and evolving them. And uh, I, uh, typically, you have like Confluent Schema Registry is a very well-known uh, tool. Uh, it is Confluent Community uh, licensed, and uh, um, there are certain restrictions on it, which might you might have to like you know uh, think about. Have a, uh, like if you want to have a forethought, you might not want to use it, but it's uh, something nice to start off with because it has all the bells and whistles. Um, and uh, in, or in place of that, you can always uh, use uh, Red Hat's artifact registry. It's, uh, there is a nice blog uh, from Red Hat where uh, you can, uh, where they just say, like, you just drop this in, uh, you know, uh, in place of schema registry. But yeah, I haven't tried it. Uh, I would suggest, uh, you know, uh, if anybody wants to try it, that'll be a great option. Um, and also using Con uh, Confluent Avro Converter, this does a really good job of uh, integrating with uh, the schema registry and uh, detects uh, the schema automatically as soon as the data comes through, uh, let's say, Kafka. And uh, it uh, sort of stores it and versions it, evolves it as uh, new fields and uh, old fields uh, uh, you know, change. Um, and uh, some of the other tools, obviously, which I will be mostly focusing on here are uh, open source and cloud native, uh, Kubernetes, obviously, on uh, the cloud of your choice, and uh, Kafka, uh, of, uh, which I, I will use as like a uh, ingestion pipeline um, uh, platform. And uh, the uh, 
this is something which many people might not know. Uh, there is a project called Apache Camel. Um, there are uh, several connectors that uh, Apache Camel has and which they have built uh, specifically for uh, Kafka Connect, uh, which are very useful. You'll have to tweak around a little bit, uh, play around a little, and uh, do a little bit of modification here and there uh, to get it to work. But uh, most of the time, um, many of the uh, general use cases are uh, there, uh, and uh, that's one set. And there are also uh, some free connectors which are available uh, within uh, Confluence uh, uh, Hub. Um, and for stream processing, uh, you can start off with KSQL DB in your dev environments just to like you know quickly uh, start off on looking at your Kafka streams. But uh, I would suggest in production, obviously, like Flink is a better choice. And uh, I think even uh, uh, the folks from Kafka and Confluent are moving towards Flink, uh, supporting Flink. Uh, and uh, Strimzy, uh, it, it's a CNCF project as well, where like all Kafka and uh, Kafka Connect and uh, uh, relative uh, like ecosystem uh, tools like it can run within Strimzy, and you can use um, uh, Kafka more uh, you know in a more uh, managed way uh, than uh, you know if you don't want to use say MSK or something, you, uh, I would suggest like try some, uh, Strimzy. Um, and cloud events, as I mentioned, uh, for standardizing your uh, data. So, um, and then uh, like a few more things, like why why we want to choose Kafka is uh, because of its uh, capability uh, in uh, you know handling uh, large data feeds and uh, in inbuilt uh, scalability, and uh, uh, just having that ecosystem around it is also really helpful. Uh, and Kafka Connect. Uh, Ability to uh, integrate with uh, several data sources. Um, I think that's one of the most important, uh, uh, you know, aspects of uh, Kafka Connect, uh, which I really like. Um, and uh, you can also build your own connectors within Kafka Connect, so that's really great to have. Um, Observability, obviously, like you want to uh, see, like there are data catalog tools um, uh, which uh, help you observe, like uh, look at like the schema and the data that is flowing through, um, and this is really helpful because uh, for you uh, as a, a person who is expected to deliver on, uh, you know, on your promises to uh, stakeholders, you want to be able to use a data catalog. Uh, there, there are several solutions. I will not uh, name them. Um, right now. Um, and uh, platform monitoring, uh, we use uh, Grafana, Prometheus, uh, you know, more so uh, with Kubernetes uh, uh, than any other thing, and they're pretty good and robust. Um, and uh, moving on, uh, let's see, the platform build tools, this uh, really like, you know, using Helm uh, to run uh, Kafka and Ka uh, Kafka Connect, uh, the connectors uh, as well, like within the Kafka Connect. Uh, there are CRDs for that, that which uh, Strimzy pro uh, provides. And uh, Strimzy itself has its own CRD uh, to run on um, Kubernetes and uh, uh, schema registry as well. So uh, you can just build Helm charts for all of them and uh, uh, deploy them. Um, Terraform is great. Uh, uh, which can help you deploy things uh, like you know, like for uh, you know your uh, data stream uh, applications, uh, stream processing applications like uh, uh, Flink or even uh, uh, KSQL DB headless apps. Um, so uh, yeah, and again, any deployment tools of choice, uh, Jenkins or Git pipelines, any of them uh, are great. Like uh, there's uh, you know uh, really just a, a way of um, uh, building your CI CD around the data platform. That makes it very, uh, you know, sort of like a software pl uh, platform and uh, uh, helps you manage it much better and, fo and have your data engineers focus on what insights and what uh, uh, data products they can deliver on rather than just fixing things here and like, you know, trying to change the data type there. These are all real world problems which data engineering teams deal with and it's a pain. So how, uh, so within the ingestion, um, right, so this is uh, really like how you wanna uh, 
consider like based upon like your data sources. You can either push events into Kafka or have Kafka Connect do pull-based uh, streams. Uh, as I mentioned, there are uh, several connectors, uh, source connectors for different uh, uh, source types. Um, and SMTs exist, which also help you deal with like a specific message, uh, um, you know, uh, per message uh, transforms that you can uh, perform, uh, flattening, uh, cast, uh, casting uh, data types into one, uh, from one to the other. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, schema registry, different levels of compatibility. So Confluent has all of this, uh, but yeah, uh, you can try to uh, also leverage uh, the artifact registry uh, uh, from uh, Red Hat um, as a drop-in replacement. So. Uh, yeah, that, and uh, moving on um, next uh, to stream processing. Um, here, uh, one thing which I really found um, helpful is creating lookup tables. Uh, um, and uh, this is uh, why I want to pitch stream processing in place of batch processing for data engineers is um, you are dealing with one message at a time, uh, the, uh, a way, uh, like, and you're dealing with like a small chunk of messages uh, or data at a time, uh, rather than like dealing with like uh, a TB worth of data and trying to handle them in like your uh, scripts, trying to build windows and uh, aggregate and uh, you know transform stuff within that is a pain. Um, so I am uh, I. I'm one of those evangelists for stream processing um, uh, compared to batch processing, and uh, and it it really definitely makes a difference in how you maintain it and uh, um, you know uh, what you get out of it is uh, quite valuable. Um, Storage and dissemination, this is, again, like you have Kafka Connect. So as I mentioned, there is source connectors. And similarly, there are sync connectors for uh, different target locations. And uh, here, too, you uh, can you leverage you know, the Camel uh, project or uh, free uh, connectors from uh, Confluent Hub. Uh, uh, there are paid connectors, but like, you know, uh, which are probably available via Confluent's own uh, uh, you know, uh, cloud service. Um, and then uh, the, uh, you know, for, for instance, I want to talk about like the BigQuery Sync Connector, which, uh, you know, when it, uh, it integrates well with uh, Kafka and then uh, the Kafka Connect um, uh, uh, Connector also integrates with the schema registry, identifies what the schema is for a specific uh, piece of data, uh, is able to uh, evolve your tables on BigQuery uh, on its own. It creates, updates the tables based on the schema, upserts into the tables or new partitions, and the data is now readily available. Any new change that happens at the source is now replicable like without any intervention by the data engineer. Um, and uh, such, like, uh, you know, uh, such abilities are, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, can add a lot of value, um, obviously, to our pipelines. And um, as, yeah, as we all know, data warehouse storage uh, many a times is also used for reporting and uh, for also, like, you know, training uh, uh, models uh, and uh, building models um, for uh, ML and AI. And also, many a times, your stakeholders might want to send the data to other systems, in which case you'll probably have to use uh, some cloud-specific tools to, uh, you know, say, AWS's Lambda or uh, Cloud Functions in GCP, for instance, and then uh, uh, be able to read from uh, the topics or the, the streams and then uh, write to your uh, uh, preferred destinations. Um, monitoring and security. Uh, this. As I mentioned, uh, Grafana and Prometheus are, uh, you know, when, once you fairly integrate them uh, into your platform and data streams, uh, they can add a lot of value, alerting, uh, you know, when there is an issue uh, so that you are uh, proactive in uh, handling them. Um, so securing everything with RBAC, uh, this is a, a very important uh, because there are, are times when there are ad hoc users who just want to access certain um, uh, data, uh, but they don't need it after that. So you want to have like time-based revocation, um, for instance. 
So putting it all together, this is fairly like a, an abstract representation of how it would uh, look. And you have uh, Strimzy uh, within which you're running uh, Kafka and Kafka Connect. Um, and you have uh, the schema registry, uh, which you know, uh, integrates and stream processing runs on top of uh, Kafka. And you have all of your uh, uh, data catalog uh, alerting automation uh, monitoring and RPAC uh, as your uh, important uh, pieces within the architecture. So this builds like a wholesome architecture that, you know, once you set this up, this really like um, uh, takes a lot of time off of people's hands uh, in focusing on the kind of problems that they should be focusing on and not dealing with, uh, you know, pipeline failures, uh, for instance, for like a, a data type change. Um, so when we built this, like what would we learn from this, right? Like uh, some of the advantages, um, as I mentioned earlier, there are uh, Kafka and Kafka Connect have good integrations um, and ubiquitousness uh, due to the usage of standards and useful tools like the ecosystem built around it. Um, and KSQL DB has a few downsides. This was something which uh, we began uh, realizing early on. It has um, uh, a way of like uh, doing certain things very easily, uh, like enriching um, and joining uh, data. Uh, we can do it fairly easily. But then if you want to aggregate within a window, for instance, uh, then it begins to uh, sort of fail. Where, uh, whereas uh, Flink, adds a lot of value there. And um, so resolving your schemas uh, automatically, this is uh, very important. This is something which uh, uh, when I started off was like, uh, I literally wrote schemas by hand and evolved them when uh, people change their uh, schemas at the source and uh, it's not a fun thing to do. Uh, this was, uh, yeah, a few years back when uh, things were not uh, as, um, you know, available as uh, they are right now, the kind of tools that are available right now. Um, so, yeah, optimizing your transformations with stream processing, um, again, adds value. And uh, so always, yeah, this is another thing. This uh, we usually neglect in, um, you know, uh, uh, while we are building a data platform is we uh, ignore talking to stakeholders, um, but we should always talk to them to ensure that they're benefiting from the data um, that we are uh, uh, generating for them. And if no connector exists, there is a way in which you can, um, uh, the whole like formula of building a connector is also available that you can build them yourself. And also learn from existing ones which are uh, open source. And uh, yeah, some of the open source communities which we used uh, were like CNCF, so, uh, you know, Strimzy and uh, Cloud Events on Slack, like uh, generally engaging with the community, trying to understand what are the uh, general uh, problems that they were solving. And uh, Apache Camel project uh, on GitHub, like you have issues, uh, the issues page on GitHub is a fairly active one. Um, you can post issues, you can ask for enhancements, uh, but yeah, uh, if you want, you can also fork and uh, do build your own, um, you know, enhancements on top of those uh, 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 connectors. Um, yeah, uh, I'll want to just end this talk with this quote uh, about like, you know, uh, how we want to keep on learning um, and uh, we'll always be evolving. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your time and att uh, attending this talk. And uh, please feel free to ask any questions. Thanks. Thank you. No questions. Okay. Hey, um, I've got a quick question for you. Yeah. Um, in terms of like data quality and kind of that end of testing all of your transformations and the like f final product coming out of your platform, do you have like suggested OSS libs that you like for that? Um, so, uh, so just making sure I heard you right, you're asking about data quality uh, yeah. and how to ensure data quality. Yep. 
Yeah, uh, so data quality, um, you have to uh, sort of uh, study your data sources, like as I said, the pre-processing step, which I mentioned, uh, really uh, focus on um, uh, the data quality. Uh, it's, it should not be an afterthought. You want to think about it initially. Uh, as I said, like some of the um, problems that I have encountered are, you know, there are five different terms multiple teams use for the same thing. And then they have, each has like a, a set of, uh, uh, you know, items under them. And uh, you want to bring them all together. And uh, how you bring them together uh, also matters. Um, so that is one of the problems. The other one is finding there are fields which were used like a decade back and no longer in use, which are not updated. There is no relevancy to those fields, making sure that you weed those out initially itself. Um, and SMTs are a great way of uh, doing that. Uh, like any time you want to do that, like whenever you're, uh, let's say you're doing a pull-based model, like uh, you're pulling the data, mm -hmm. uh, you want to see, okay, these fields are like, you know that uh, are not needed, but they exist in the data source, and you don't want to rely on, like, you know, you don't want to have a dependency on that other team to fix that stuff. So you can uh, use those, but you'll all, all, always have to have this conversation with yep. the stakeholders. Yeah. So that's that's at like the first layer of just like from from pure ingestion, but you're not necessarily like suggesting paths oh, after you, that. Could you come closer? Please? Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. uh, are are you suggesting only at the ingestion layer, or like what about like? post transformations mm -hmm. or, or whatnot. Do you have additional layers of data quality checks that you like there? Yeah, so uh, what happens is initially like uh, uh, you join your data sources or let's say you enrich them. Uh, you end up with uh, bad data. Sometimes there are duplicates. There are duplicates is like the low bar like yeah. uh, for like, uh, you know, uh, and uh, deduping data, there are several strategies that uh, stream processing uh, uh, like gives, like Flink gives like several ways of like deduping uh, data, um, which you can use. Uh, I haven't encountered other kinds of issues there, these kinds of issues, but if you solve them beforehand, you're not gonna mostly encounter them there. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah, no problem, thanks. All right, thank you all. Uh, looks like there are no more questions and uh, I'll see you all, have a nice evening.